I welcome you to the uh, panel discussion today, ensuring the emotional health, well-being, and educational success of children and young adults. I'm Francine Glick, Barnard Class of 77, and very proud parent of 09. Um, and I'm, the member, I'm a member on the uh, Task Force Planning Committee for this conference. So today I have the honor of introducing the women who will discuss this important issue. Dr. Anne-Marie Albano, Professor of Medical Psychology at Columbia University Medical Center, and Sian Bellock, the eighth president of Barnard College, whose inauguration occurred on Friday, and it was wonderful. <laughs> the moderator for this panel is Katie Jennings from um, Class of 2014 Journalism, and she will tell you more about the speakers. But first, I just want to tell you a little bit about Katie. Uh, Katie is a reporter for Politico in New Jersey, where she writes about policy and politics with a focus on health care. She appears regularly on TV and radio, and prior to Politico, Katie worked with a team from Columbia Journalism School on a year-long investigation into ExxonMobil's internal climate change research. So in today's discussion, you will hear from our speakers, and they will talk about advances in mental health care for children and young adults, concerns about the rising rates of depression and substance abuse among adolescents, and community advocacy and services to promote em emotional health. So there will be a panel discussion and there will be time for some questions afterwards. Thank you. Good morning, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, first, I'll just add a little bit to the introductions of our panelists. And uh, then we'll begin. So I'd like to introduce Sian Bylock. She's a cognitive scientist and the eighth president of Barnard College. Before joining Barnard in July of 2017, President Bylock spent 12 years at the University of Chicago where she held several senior leadership positions and was the Stella M. Raleigh Professor of Psychology. She studies performance anxiety, what happens in the brain and the body during stressful situations and why sometimes we succeed and sometimes we fail. She focuses on success in math and science for women and girls. Her most recent book, How the Body Knows Its Mind, The Surprising Power of the Physical Environment to Influence How You Think and Feel, was published in 2015. She is also the author of Choke, What the Secrets of the Brain Reveal About Getting It Right When You Have To. And so we'll be discussing some of those secrets in our discussion today. Uh, then Anne-Marie Albano is a professor of medical psychology and psychiatry. She is the director of the Columbia University Clinic for Anxiety and Related Disorders and the clinical site director of New York Presbyterian's Youth Anxiety Center. Dr. Albano studies and treats anxiety disorders in youth. She was a principal investigator of a large-scale study funded by the National Institute of Mental Health, a child adolescent anxiety multimodal treatment study, and a follow-up which set the standard of practice for treating youth with anxiety and depression. She is the inaugural editor of the journal Evidence-Based Practice in Child and Adolescent Mental Health and the author of more than 100 articles and chapters. And her book, You and Your Anxious Child, Free Your Child from Fears and Worries and Create a Joyful Family Life, was published in 2013. So, Today, we're going to have a discussion about anxiety, performance anxiety, and these anxiety disorders, which are among some of the most common conditions affecting children and youth today. Um, excuse me. <laughs> uh, and also the associated pressures when it comes to school and careers, especially for emerging adults. We'll talk about research, treatment, and then psychological tools the role of parents, schools, and other institutions. And so we'll have about 50 minutes of discussion, and then we'll open it up for questions. And we do hope that you ask questions at either of the microphones uh, on either side of the auditorium. So Dr. Albano, to kick it off, we're going to start with the very basics. And we're just going to say, what is anxiety, and what are the trends that you're seeing? Well, what is anxiety is what we're experiencing right now up here, with all of you looking at us. Uh, <laughs> A very, it's a basic, very natural, normal emotion. 
uh, that when it's working well on our behalf, prepares us to deal with stress, deal with danger, motivates us to take care of our basic needs and also our aspirational needs. Um, so anxiety is something that we need and we need to embrace. When anxiety becomes a problem, however, is when it goes out of control. It's when alarms are set off through our brain neural systems, especially something called the amygdala that maybe Sian could talk a little more about. But when it sets off alarms, when there's nothing really to be running from in terms of danger, you're sitting in a classroom and all of a sudden you start, your heart starts racing and you start thinking, I have to get out of here. What is that about? So when anxiety goes off when it shouldn't, when your worry or your ideas about what if, what if this goes wrong, what if I fail, what if I can't, when that starts consuming you, and so the frontal lobes work in overtime for telling you that anything and everything can go wrong, that's worry. So when anxiety goes out of control, we might think about at the level of a disorder, the way it interferes with your functioning and gets in the way of your life. Fair enough. And I would also just add that if we didn't have any anxiety, we'd be dead, right? So that's important <laughs> to remember. It's not, um, it's not always a bad thing. And um, in my research, we often talk about different types of anxiety. So you can have the worry, um, the ruminations, the what ifs, but you can also have these physiological responses, the sweaty palms, the beating heart. And it turns out that they don't always have to go hand in hand. So we know that if a child is uh, getting ready, sitting for a test, and they have sweaty palms and beating hard, and they read um, a research article about the idea that that means you're about to choke or do poorly, they will do poorly on the test. But instead, if they are reminded that that sweaty palm and beating heart the heart is actually shunting blood to the brain, which they need to think, those physiological responses can actually be turned to good. Um, so how you think about your physiological responses and what you're actually ruminating about actually matter. So what are we seeing in terms of the trends? Are we getting more anxious as a society or are we getting better at identifying it or is it both? It's both, it definitely is both. If we think from a clinical perspective, we actually have only been um, characterizing anxiety disorders since 1980. Prior to that, you could be diagnosed essentially with neuroses or psychoses. Um, but in 1980, the diagnostic classif classification system was standardized, was made more empirical and scientific. And so clusters of symptoms were put together um, to define different types of anxiety diagnoses. Separation anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder, or fear of what other people think and negative evaluation, <laughs> generalized anxiety disorder, worry run amok, panic disorder, and so forth. We've been then doing epidemiological studies following the prevalence of these disorders in the US population and then also in other countries only since about the 1980s. And what we find is that they are the most common conditions affecting everyone. And we, in fact, in the most recent study of adolescents that was done, find that these diagnoses begin by age five or six, increase in prevalence through adolescence, and pick up other diagnoses such as depression, substance abuse, so they can become gateway disorders. And I think one really interesting point here is that um, we're seeing these anxieties very early on. So in my research, we've been particularly interested in when especially young girls start to develop anxiety about math, a fear that they can't do math. And it turns out both um, boys and girls, men and women in our society often fear math, and that's a talk for another day. Mm -hmm. um, but we wondered when these sorts of anxieties started, and oftentimes researchers had suggested that it wasn't until middle or high school until the math got really difficult or more challenging. And what we've shown is that as young as first grade, uh, young girls can develop and boys can develop anxiety about math. And some of that actually comes from the people around them. So if you have an elementary school teacher who happens to be particularly anxious about math, um, then you're more likely by the end of the school year, even in first grade, to start fearing math. And it turns out that this ends up um, falling along gender lines because one of the most anxious majors um, one of the most majors in college that are most anxious about math are elementary education majors. Mm -hmm. um, and can anyone guess what's very homogeneous about elementary education teachers? <laughs> Does anyone know? Mm -hmm. 
97% of first grade teachers in the US are women. And so what we've shown is that when you put highly anxious women in the classroom, the young girls by the end of the school year are performing worse in math and they're more likely to pick up on stereotypes that they shouldn't be good at math. So these things mm -hmm. start very early. Mm -hmm. We also should mention that fears are normal, right? And so, and there is like a 120 year history now of studying and tracking just typical developmental fears. Fear of strangers, fear of separation from caretakers, fear of the dark, fear of doctors and dentists and so forth. Fears start from early on and it's sort of an evolutionary process that you have a little bit of fear, you learn how to manage it, and you move on from that. These fears served a purpose before there was civilization and security and all kinds of you know, modern conveniences and such. Because if you were in the wild, to be separated from the parent, well, yeah, the baby starts crying and the parent can come and find it and get it before a predator does. Okay. But they stick, they come on at certain ages, and they go off after the child gets experience with that situation. So fears are common. Girls have more fears than boys or report more fears than boys. Younger children will identify up to 10 fears. By the time they're in adolescence, they're down to two to three. And the focus of fear changes with age. So that's been there. But as a society, just rates of overall anxiety and this like ready to pop off with a panic attack in essence has been increasing. And there are multiple influences we think behind that. Yeah, and one influence in especially um, in the classroom is just this idea or the, that one has to strive for perfection, that there's not any room for failure, that there's one linear path. And there's a lot of psychological research showing that how you actually talk to your kid about success is really important. So if your uh, young daughter or your young son is, does really well in a particular subject in reading or in math and you say, oh, I can see you're just really talented at that, that sends a signal that you either have it or you don't. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that when you send that signal, kids don't want to fail. Because if they fail, maybe that means they don't have it. But instead, if you say, oh, I can see you tried really hard and you succeeded at that, if they then fail, it means that they can try a different way to get there. So even how we praise our kids really matters. Praising effort, not ability, um, matters for when they take challenges and for how they think about failure. Is this something I can change, or am I just stuck with this? I'm not good at this. And you hear this a lot, especially in, in subjects I study, oh, I'm not a math person. Yeah. Well, that suggests mm -hmm. either you have it or you don't. And I can tell you that that, can I swear in here? That's bullshit, right? <laughs> the data shows that there's no reason that a woman or a young girl should be any different at math and science than a boy. The brain is not different in terms of facilitating those skills, and there's no reason that you shouldn't be able to learn this type of information. Dr. Albano, I believe when I was watching another one of your talks, is it one in five, when we're looking at this emerging adult population, 18 to 28 has, is showing some sign of an anxiety disorder? What, like, how prevalent is it mm -hmm. within the population? Well, let's bear in mind that throughout childhood, the rates of anxiety disorders range from 12% to 30% for anxiety, for separation, social anxiety, generalized anxiety. And then as we're hitting young adulthood, we're looking at about 22% of young adults, 18 to 28 years of age, are presenting with an anxiety diagnosis at any given time in the year. Lifetime prevalence goes up to 30-something percent in young adults. And so again, what's happening that these kids are not growing out of their anxieties. And this is something that we have to pay attention to. It used to be that your child comes in, they're sleeping in your bed at four years of age, they're still in your bed at 10 years of age, and people are telling you, oh, they'll grow out of it, wait till they hit puberty. Well, I have to tell you, as a follow-up in our study, one of our studies, 24-year-old uh, young woman who was in our study um, received treatment, we then followed her up 10 years later, 24 years old, married with a baby, you think wonderful, still living at home, never left the house. Mom actually went to college with her and sat in the classes with her daughter where she met the boyfriend, tell me about this guy who moved then in with the family, <laughs> <laughs> got married and they had a baby. But think about this, you know, they don't just grow out of when it's a diagnosis, okay? And we also, we could talk, we're gonna talk about this, the transmission of anxiety and or the maintenance of it in a family system, now we have another generation, a baby, who is at high risk, genetically, environmentally, in all different ways. 
So we'll definitely get to the role of the family in this. But before we go in depth on the research, what I was hoping is maybe mm -hmm. you could both just tell us how you decided to pursue this course of study, and then also in line with the conference, uh, whether there were any women along the way who opened the door for you. Yeah, so everyone asked me, you know, why, how did I get into this uh, role? And I'm very open about it. I do a little bit of me search in addition to <laughs> research. Um, so I always wanted to know why I sometimes put my best foot forward in important situations and sometimes I didn't. So I was a great practice test taker, but I never put my best foot forward in the actual test. And I also played sports at a pretty high level and I had one of the worst games of my life in front of a national coach. And I was interested in what happened in the brain, in the body, when we want to perform at our best, when we're motivated, we want to succeed, and we just can't put it forward. And so I wanted to unlock or uncover psychological tools that we could use to better perform. And I thought for many years I was going to go to law school, because my I, have, I come from a family of lawyers. Um, and I think my mom is in the room here somewhere, actually. But um, she knew if she told me not to go to law school, I most definitely would. So she spent an entire summer taking me out to lunch with every unhappy lawyer she knew. And I started <laughs> thinking, well, maybe this isn't what I want to do. And there was nothing wrong with law school, um, but she wanted to make sure that I knew what fields were out there. And I actually really didn't. And it wasn't until I went to see a panel of female scientists and I heard a woman who was a faculty member at Berkeley, a biologist, who later went on to win a Nobel Prize, talk about how her entire career had been a failure, one failure after another in terms of thinking she was going in a particular direction in her research and not getting the outcome she thought. And then she got to test a new outcome. And I thought, oh my god, you could make a career out of failing? That is so cool. <laughs> and so I started looking into to going on to do a PhD. That's great. That's um, me. Search is my life too. I was a multiphobic child, afraid of everything, at such a level that I wouldn't tell my parents when I was feeling sick because if I needed to go to a doctor and get a needle, literally my uh, pediatrician slapped me when I was about seven years old for the temper tantrum I was, you know, thrown in his office. Um, but really, the the big thing happened when we moved from New York City to Florida as I started high school and the anxiety that I had of being such a strange banana in this fruit bowl down there <laughs> with my accent. The teachers actually made fun of me, had me stand up and say, you know, they'd say, Ann Albano, and I'd say, here, and they'd say, oh, stand up, say dog. Dog. <laughs> you know, and so I begged my mother and father to send me back to New York and put me in a home. I didn't care where, just get me back to New York to a relative. <coughs> and my mom, as a mentor, I didn't realize it at the time for cognitive behavior therapy, which really didn't exist much then, she kept giving me excuses. Well, go to school, you got to do the work. I've got the Monsignor that I'm calling him, he's going to see if he could get you into a school. You know, I'd go to school a couple days later. Did you hear from the Monsignor? And remember, this is a time of writing letters. Oh, he's talking to the Archbishop. We're, we're finding out if we could get you to school. I mean, nowadays, I just say, Mom, text the Pope. We've got to figure this out. <laughs> so I, you know, looking back in those days, and what happened over time is, of course, within a couple of weeks, I had friends. I, my mom made me stay in it. And this persisted even through to when I wanted to quit grad school and I called her from Oxford, Mississippi saying, get me the hell out of here. And she's like, okay, if you want to quit, quit, come home. No one's really ever quit in our family before, but that's okay. <laughs> come home, we'll figure something out. You know, this is like what she did is the basis of cognitive restructuring <coughs> that we'll talk about and also exposure therapy. And you know, this sort of set the stage. I have a sense or had a good sense of what anxiety felt like for these kids. And when I wound up with a mentor who really focused on the anxiety disorders, who happened to be David Barlow, a male, he, he enabled me and allowed me to just pursue this. Um, so it's really been mom has been the mentor in my life. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. <clears throat> so, um, <laughs> excuse me, sorry. Now we'll move on to the research. So at some point in all of our lives, I'm sure that we've experienced this choking phenomenon. So we're taking a test, we're on the soccer field, we are in a meeting at work. <clears throat> so we're in front of an audience. <laughs> we're in front of an audience and we're literally choking. Um, okay. So what does your research tell us about how we can better approach these situations? 
Yeah, so um, first of all, I don't think you are born a choker or a thriver in these kinds of situations. I think these are learned skills. And so the first question is what happens in the brain and body in these stressful situations? What goes wrong? And that is something that my research group has been really interested in exploring because then that allows us to start thinking about means or tools to affect change, to help ensure that we perform at our best. So one thing that we know in these stressful situations is that emotional centers of our brain, um, these neural alarm signals go off. So our amygdala, um, areas associated with fear, they are really sort of screaming in this situation. And they're competing with resources with areas of the brain that we know help us focus our attention. And so, um, these neural alarm signals go off and they almost shunt down those areas that allow us to focus and perform at our best. Um, and that's problematic because we need our attention. We only have a limited amount of it at a time. Um, and that's why it's not good to drive and talk on the cell phone at the same time because now we're doing two things at once. And being in an anxious situation is like driving and being on the cell phone. You can't pay attention to everything at the same time. And so it's harder to focus on what you need to focus on. And so in my research, we've looked a lot at how to tamp down those neural alarm signals, how to quiet them down. And one thing that we've found, for example, is that actually thinking about your um, stressful situation in a different way, not in terms of what you're gonna lose if you fail or how everyone's gonna be disappointed in you, but maybe one thing you're gonna try and achieve or why you've actually succeeded in the past, why you should perform well in this situation can help tamp those neural alarm signals down. It helps allow that frontal cortex cortex to focus on what it needs to. Um, so that's going into a test thinking not, oh God, I'm, this is so hard, I'm gonna fail, but actually thinking I aced the last three tests or I did really well on my homework. And just how we think about a situation can affect whether we thrive or choke. Could you tell us about the specific uh, study that you did around math anxiety and what the solution was that you found? Yeah, so I've looked a lot at um, students and actually adults when they're anxious about math. Um, and one we thing we've shown is that it's not really that being bad at math causes you to be anxious about it or when you perform poorly at math, you're anxious about it. Rather, the anxiety causes you to perform poorly at math, right? So there's something about the anxiety itself. And we did a study using a neuroscientific technique called fMRI, MRI, so an MRI machine, probably you all know about those. Um, it's called magnetic resonance imaging, and all it is is a big magnet. All it does is measure the magnetic properties of whatever's inside it, which is why you're not supposed to go in an MRI when you're wearing something that's metal, because you'll get sucked into the magnet. Um, and functional MRI, which is what we use to look inside the brain, is just a slight tweak on that. And it basically measures the magnetic properties um, of your brain in a way that allows us to get uh, an idea about brain functioning. So um, our different tissue has different magnetic properties, so that's how we get a picture of the brain. But with this slight tweak, we can actually infer which areas of the brain are working the hardest because when an area of the brain is working, it needs resources, it needs oxygen, it needs glucose, and the blood carries those resources. And when the blood is carrying those resources, it has different magnetic properties. So you can actually pick up on which area of the brain's are work, brain is working the hardest with this fMRI. So we actually brought people who are really anxious about math to our laboratory. We didn't tell them it was about math to begin with or they wouldn't have shown up. And they got there and we said, surprise, you're gonna do some math and we're gonna have you do it while you're in this brain scanner. Um, no one ran off. And what we did is we looked at what was happening in the brain just when we told them they were gonna do math, not even when they were doing the math problems itself. And what we showed is that when we just told them they were gonna do math, these neural alarm signals went off and it actually shunted down the areas they needed when they were actually doing the math. So that's, they're not doing any math, they just know it's coming and we yeah. can see this anxious reaction. Mm -hmm. And so knowing that, now we can ask questions about how to change that. So one thing that we've shown, for example, is that getting people to write up down their thoughts and worries ahead of time helps calm down those neural alarm signals. It's kind of like that really mean email you're gonna send to someone that you never send, but you write it and you feel better. It's sort of getting it out, getting mm -hmm. perspective, knowing it's not such a big deal. That can calm down those neural alarm signals and then the, that front part of your brain that needs to focus has the fuel. 
So do you think that that's transferable to other situations, or have you found that it is? Yeah, so we've shown that getting ready for big presentations or tests, just getting those thoughts down on paper and rereading them. You know you know that it, at the end, generally, people are saying, oh, this is not such a big deal. It's almost like you download them from the mind. They're less likely to pop up in the moment and distract you. Got it. So now we'll segue to, so that is this acute situation when we're under stress, we're under pressure. Dr. Albano is, stu is studying children who have these more these anxiety disorders that are spreading over a longer period of time. So can you tell us about your work at the Youth Anxiety Center and what you found and what the most effective ways of treating these disorders are? Mm -hmm. So our work really builds very nicely over what Sian has studied because what happens is we're looking at youth who have anxiety disorders, they could be, their anxieties could be triggered in social situations for fear of negative evaluation, could be triggered um, by being separated from loved ones like when you go off to college or in, in many different kinds of ways. What we've demonstrated from early on is we need to get in and not just have a child or you know a, a young adult sit and talk about their fears. Instead, we have a sort of tripartite way of going in and addressing the anxiety. If we help them to see, number one, what sets them off and what causes anxiety to rise that puts them in that state of anxious apprehension, as you're describing, this thing in front of me, I can't handle, I can't predict how it's going to go, I just know that I'm not good at this and it's going to be a failure. If we can help them to identify, I get sweaty palms, I have a heart racing and such, number one is we could start teaching them some self-soothing. So part of what we do is giving them some tools to sit back, take a breath, start to calm down. Second thing is, what are they saying to themselves as this situation is either coming up or it could be down the line, but where does the worry and the churning inside start? And exactly as what you're saying, we get them to start being a better internal cognitive coach to themselves. And to put it in, in this way, we, we teach this to the kids and to the parents. If you were sending a little one out to play t-ball for the first time, and the coach, when that child uh, tried to hit the t-ball but kept missing it, if that coach was standing there selling, telling them, what the heck is wrong with you? Oh my gosh, you're never going to be able to do this. Why do we have you on our team? That, what's the child going to want to do the next day when mom says, let's go back to play t-ball again? But if you had a coach who was sitting there saying, OK, gee, take a look. I think you were standing a little too far away from the t-ball. Let's move a little closer. Try it again. And the kid hits, you know, uh, swings again and misses. All right, but look, you, that was great. You got closer. Now let's keep a watch on the ball. If the coach is giving instruction about this situation, what I can do, and the coach gives them more time to practice, brings them back to try it again and again to sharpen their skills, then their internal cognitive coach, of course, is one that's focusing on effort and focusing on where have I done this before, how has it gone, what can I do differently, what can I attack right now that I know I have control over. And then the third thing, of course, anxiety is your <laughs> biggest foe when it gets you to lock down and avoid. And kids with anxiety disorders, I mean, right now is our high time at the Youth Anxiety Center at New York Presbyterian, where we have our college kids who have flamed out after first semester. These kids stop going to class if they get behind and then feel they can't go talk to the professor to ask how to catch up, or they're overwhelmed by the work, they haven't made friends because they're too anxious to ask someone, can you go to dinner with me, and so on and so forth. And they came home at Thanksgiving, many of them, and didn't tell the parents they were in trouble. But then they got letters from the deans when they went back, and the parents had to come pick them up. So these kids are in there now. What we are doing is we repeatedly put them in situations to experience the anxiety, but have these tools to work with it, and again and again practice the situations. We do that live through what's called behavioral exposure, but then also with our new virtual reality that I'll, we could talk about, too. So treatment has to involve calming, coaching, and then also experiencing situations again and again, as realistic as possible, but then also talking about and, and managing the context, because we need help from parents and anyone who in the environment is really working with the youth in some way. We've got to get them also to change the way that they may be overprotecting. 
Yeah, there's a great study that builds on that. And since we're just starting the Olympics, I, this seems, it seems appropriate to bring up. So um, Team Canada, the Olympic uh, Organization for Canada, does a lot with the psychology of performance. And they, did, they have neuroscientists that work with them. And they did this amazing study um, where they took swimmers, Olympians or those who'd swam and were getting ready to go to the Olympic trials. And they took swimmers who choked, so performed worse than expected given their times in the actual situation. So it was the trials or the Olympics. And they did something kind of mean, but it was in the name of science. They put them in the brain scanner and they had them watch videos of their failed performances. Uh, you know, these are athletes, good. they're tough. Yeah. Um, and what they showed when they looked inside the brain was that these neural alarm signals were going off. The amygdala, these areas were very active. And then they took a group of them and they had them do this cognitive behavioral therapy where they, every time they thought about their failed performance, instead of thinking about that they let down their country and their coaches, they had them think about what they did wrong in mechanical terms. Maybe they got off the blocks later, their stroke wasn't smooth. And one thing they would change, they would do differently this, the next time. And they had them do this every time they thought about their failure and other swimmers, they didn't do this. And then they put them back in the scanner two weeks later in the brain scanner, and they had them watch the videos of the failed race again. And what they showed is that for those swimmers who'd practiced thinking about what they'd done wrong in non-emotional terms and that one thing they were going to do differently the next time, those neural alarm signals were less likely to be active. Mm -hmm. There was less activity in these negative emotional centers of the brain. And Team Canada thinks this is great. They do this pool, pool side now. If a swimmer has That's a bad great. race, they pull them out. They do this coaching. And the idea is that there's actually how we think about how we're going to perform actually is a biological manifestation <laughs> in the resources we have to perform. And so if we can focus in the right way, our brains and our body are better equipped to help us. That's right. And I went to talk mm -hmm. to Team Canada about this, and one of my colleagues was like, tell them the wrong thing. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I said, science has yeah. no international boundaries. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're objective. <laughs> so, Dr. Albano, you are also using video, but in a different way. Can you tell us about this virtual reality experience that you're using as treatment? Yes. Yeah, so, one of the things that that drives cognitive behavioral therapy, the the uh, active ingredient, is the exposure, exposing an individual to what they are avoiding. So for individuals with panic attacks, for example, and agoraphobia, they don't leave the house, we have to help them get out of the house, go to the grocery store, whatever it might be. Um, for individuals who are afraid of public speaking, we have to get them doing public speaking. When it comes to, uh, for the most part in therapy, when you go to a therapist and they do this, if it's um, around interpersonal situations, I'm afraid of being rejected, humiliated, things like that, you're usually role playing. The exposures are usually in the office contrived by a therapist. So think about the college age kids. When I have college students come in to our practice now, instead of role playing with me, being the roommate that they have to tell, please stop sexiling me on Friday and Saturday night, <laughs> you know, I'm not a credible college student. Now I have virtual reality where we could put them in a vir virtual reality headset and they literally are in the room. We have an avatar roommate and the therapist outside of this is controlling the actual verbal and physical responses of the avatar. Now, the avatar can't touch you, but they can tell you, dude, grow up. This is college. Get a life, and so forth. The virtual professor can tell you when you're, you go in and you say you're behind on a paper, listen, you know, why should I give you an extension? I have to give it to everybody else. Or the professor can say, well, let's figure out a plan. I mean, we have all different ways that we can have these avatars respond. The point being that it makes it a very much more realistic and contextually rich experience, which then gets that amygdala and all the brain regions and everything fooled into thinking they're actually in the experience, not with just some old therapist, and they are working and practicing again and again being in that. And then we send them to do these exposures then in real life with other people their age and so forth to assert themselves and so on. So we have a virtual classroom, virtual professor, virtual party where we're doing things including refusing alcohol and drugs, the virtual professor who can be as mean as can be or could be very lovely, just like you, Sam. <laughs> <clears throat> so I know that this is early in using this system, but do you see other applications? And for oh, example, yeah. for your work, President Bylock, when you're 
speaking to companies or talking yeah. to people about you know giving pitches or having to do these kind of high stakes thing in their work environment is it really about what's the role of practice yeah. and having mm -hmm. these experiences i mean i we when we were on the phone we both came mm -hmm. talking about this particular event we both talked about this role of practice and practicing under the kinds of conditions you're going to perform under and actually at barnard we're about to open an amazing new building the milstein center for teaching and learning and one of the um, entities in that center will be a center focused on pedagogy, getting students to practice test taking skills, um, performing under stress, getting students used mm -hmm. to the kinds of environments they're going to perform under, whether it's public speaking, right. um, taking a test, advocating for what you want. It's not enough just to know the material, but actually knowing it and being able to show it when you do have that sweaty palms and that beating heart. We talk about things like giving talks in front of the people you're going to give talks in, or if no one's willing to listen to you, doing it in front of a video camera or even a mirror. We know that mirrors make you more self-conscious, and so you get used to those sorts of feelings, mm -hmm. and you're more likely then to perform well in the moment. We also know that we have to give these kids experience with the least favorable outcome of what they're trying to do. And I learned this many years ago when we first developed our, our cognitive behavioral treatment for young adults, I'm sorry, for high school students, where a 16-year-old boy who had been um, diagnosed by me, I sat with him, found out he was extremely socially anxious, never went to a, um, a high school event, never did any extracurriculars, got to class and just sat there waiting for the clock to tick. He would find the largest person in the class and sit behind them so that maybe that would hide him from the teacher. He ate his lunch every day in a bathroom stall. So he didn't have a life at 16, and when I asked him uh, what he wanted to do for the rest, you know, five years from now, he, he really looked at me and said, if these are supposed to be the best years of my life, I don't think I'm going to be here. Okay, So that brought it home to me that these kids with social anxiety suffer greatly all the time. And so we developed this exposure-based treatment. Now, this is way before virtual reality with him, with other kids who also had the diagnosis. And lo and behold, as we're telling him to go to uh, different things at school, a girl took notice of him and asked him to the senior prom. We literally had a senior prom rehearsal <laughs> with our group, and we rehearsed everything that could go wrong. We had a partner for him who spilled a drink on him. We had a, the kids at the table, her friends didn't talk to him. And so we did everything, plus things could go right. We did everything. He came back to therapy the week after the prom. The girl had dumped him at the prom and went off with someone else. But he said to us, I asked other girls to dance. A kid who never had a date before this night. And he said, if you had only done positive stuff with me, I would have told you to go to hell. But he was ready for the fact that things don't always work out. But you can play through it and dance through it. <laughs> so we've talked about the great importance of working with the individual, but let's now talk more about the role of the other people in their lives. So the family, the schools, the institutions that are helping them. And maybe we can start with parents and family. So let me say this. We also did a study a while back, and it was with socially anxious teenagers and their parents. We gave the teenagers who had social anxiety disorder an ambiguous situation to problem solve for themselves. You go into the high school cafeteria, find a place to sit. You sit at a table with other kids. They're making plans for the weekend. Some of these kids are popular, some aren't. How would you feel? What would you do? And then the second scenario was you have to give a uh, talk in a class. You're not doing too well in that class. Um, it could be about anything you want. Some of the kids are popular, some aren't. Again, how would you feel? What would you do? We got their anxiety ratings in those situations and what their plans were. And then we brought their parents in. Problem solved, talk with your son or daughter how they would, you know, what, what you think they should do in this situation or just talk about this situation. Lo and behold, of course, we videotaped everything, and lo and behold, what we found is that the parents were actually dominating the discussions. So the kids weren't doing the talking, the parents were doing all the talking, and the parents were focusing in and saying things like, you know, they're talking about doing things on the weekend and you really don't go out much, so won't you feel weird? Wouldn't you want to go sit somewhere else? Or she said there were popular kids there. 
Um, is that going to be tough for you? Maybe you should eat fast and leave. Um, talk as fast as you can during that because you don't do well with giving oral reports and get it over with as quickly as possible. Things like that. Now, am I indicting parents? No, but the thing that was going on here is that they were giving non-constructive, non-problem solving escape types of advice. These parents, if we remember, anxiety disorders start very young, and these are 16, 15 year olds. They have been rescuing their kid from upset for the long term. They get drawn in. Your kid comes home and they're falling apart because they've been excluded, rejected, humiliated, failed something. Of course we want to comfort them. Of course we want them to feel better. We want to protect them and we want to fix it. I'm going to call the teacher and say, those kids excluded my daughter from the lunchroom table. Put, you know, fix that situation and so forth. Fine at five, not at 15. But the, this anxiety shapes the way the parents parent as well as it shapes the way the kids perform. And the more the parents are in there, the less the child has the experience of coping on their own, messing up and trying again. They think they can't do it without the parents. So. Yeah, and I would say that the parents, I mean, even very young. I mean, kids are smart and they pick up on how the parents are feeling. So we know that um, as young as five years of age, when parents are anxious about math, um, they tend to do less math with their kids. Their kids are more likely to be anxious about it. Um, and it plays out in terms of how well their kids perform. Mm -hmm. Um, but we also know that if you give parents tools to expose their kids to things they're anxious about in positive ways, it's right. not just about the homework, but we have shown, for example, that an app that's uh, called Bedtime Math, that's free, you can get it on iTunes and Android, doing bedtime math with your kids, not just reading, can be a fun way wow. to get anxious parents about math to ha help their kids excel. Um, so although parents can really be anxious and take away, they can also have a benefit in really um, important ways. And I think, you know, I'll just say, going back to the MeSearch example, this happens to me all the time, and I'm constantly working with myself. I'm doing my own cognitive behavioral therapy in terms of how I interact. I have a six-year-old. And I went in um, to her classroom earlier this year to have the parent-teacher conference, and I said you know, to her teacher, how's she doing with reading? And her teacher said, well, you know, kids progress at different levels. And I said, but there's a statistical <laughs> mean. You have to be able to tell me in the class whether she's <laughs> below or above it. This poor teacher, you know? <laughs> and then I said, there has to be an average, and she said there's a lot of kids at her level, but imagine if I'm doing this with the teacher, I am a cognitive scientist, I know, yeah. I know from the research that when you learn to predict, when you learn to read, predicts nothing. It predicts no level of achievement, and imagine if I'm doing this with her, <laughs> what my daughter is picking up with when I'm trying to read with her, and so these things really, so I had to do a little therapy yeah. on myself and step back. I can help you with that too, though. <laughs> if you help me with math, because I can't yeah. do math. <laughs> But these things really matter. And so um, we, for example, have shown that when parents just do bedtime math once a month with their first graders, their kids look like they've been in school three months later when the parents are most anxious because it's, it's three months longer in math because they're boosting them up. They're doing something in a fun, positive way that takes away the negativity and it matters even early on. So yeah, we have a, actually, we have a colleague at Nim, Top, Nim Tottenham, who's a, a neuroscientist. Alum. Yep, a Barnard alum and a neuroscientist at Columbia. What we want to do is a study where we take parents of very young, um, anxious children, and we want the parents in the fMRI and giving them the scenario while they're in the fMRI of their child struggling with an anxiety situation. Because the work that we're doing clinically now is on helping the parents identify their anxiety about their child and their child's performance, anxiety, and so forth. And we want to then test and see if we do this targeted intervention towards parents to help them change the way that they're reacting when they have uh-oh moments about their kids, that maybe that extends the effectiveness of the therapies we know we do that work for youth with anxiety disorders but they only work for a period of time before they relapse if the environment hasn't changed too, the primary environment for them. Yeah, we had one parent of a first grader say, I judge the math homework by whether it's a one glass of wine homework yeah. assignment or a three glass night. I was thinking, yeah. you can't, you know, that's, that's not maybe the best environment for perpetuating positivity around math. <laughs> <laughs>
But how do you get the message out to parents? So if they're not interacting, say, if their child isn't in therapy, but just how do you, I mean, is it through the schools? Should there be screening? Should it be through teachers? How do you get these sorts of messages out? Yeah, I mean, in my work, I'd spend um, some time talking to teachers from many different areas. Um, teachers and schools are a great way to help work with both the parents and the kids. So when you're teaching math in a new way, our kids are learning math in a different way than we learn math, making sure that we're not only teaching the kids, but also teaching the parents mm -hmm. how they interact with their kids in these situations. Um, that's one, I think, really effective avenue that we haven't we need to support the teachers to be able to do that. And we don't always do that in the best mm -hmm. way possible. We also do need mental health screenings to become a part of what happens in every pediatrician and primary care office through the time that youth are fully developed into their you know, late 20s. We don't do that. We stop asking, or pediatricians tend to stop asking about developmental milestones after their child is potty trained and can tie their shoes, or maybe Velcro the shoes these days. But there are milestones that need to be met all the way through for taking responsibility, for being more independent behaviorally, for self-soothing and dealing with your emotional upset, um, and so on and so forth. But they're not asked. And when kids have anxiety, ADHD, other diagnoses, they fall off track as compared to their peers with these milestones, and partly because parents tend to rush in and fill in the blank for whatever their youth is not doing so that they don't get behind. So literally, I have parents whose kids are at college, and the parents call them every morning and wake them up to get them to go to school. <laughs> they don't. How many? Think about if you have a teenager at home in high school, do you wake them up and feed them in the morning, or are they getting up on their own? Because a lot of our youth who are high school students do not get up on their own, do not eat unless they're given something. So there's different things. I have parents, oh my goodness, who buy the books for the classes their kids are taking at college, and they Skype every night and do the homework with them. <laughs> and if you pick up the Chronicle of Higher Education, you will see how parents are calling college professors, law school professors, med school professors, to advocate for accommodations, this and that. I don't want to beat up on parents. I just want to say this is what anxiety has done to your family. And we have to bear in mind, this is what anxiety has done, and you've got to change it. Because anxiety takes away your youth's ability to choose to do things that they want to do and want to aspire to. It takes that away and makes them think they can't and they shouldn't. All right? So we have to help give this back to kids to free them up to make decisions and choices that they want, not what they're afraid of. So now we'd like to open it up to your questions. If you, uh, sure, so could you just speak into that microphone, please? And could you just say, Maybe I can speak loudly. <laughs> yes, that'd be great. And if you could just say your name and also your affiliation. Sure. <laughs> so, could you please give me maybe the two or three things that I can do from the beginning to help bring down my anxiety, to set her up for success um, mm -hmm. as, we, as we go towards the ages that you're discussing? Yeah, I mean, I would say that um, it's really important to remember that there's not one mm -hmm. day or time for kids to do things. Kids develop at different mm -hmm. rates, and oftentimes, most often, they end up in really good places. So one thing I would do is not compare your daughter to her friends around her. That would be the first. I would also say talk a lot with her about everything. And you know, if you are um, less inclined to think about number or math, I would say talk to her a lot about math, about shapes and counting and everything. Um, I, we often don't always know to just interact and have continual conversations with our kids about everything, um, everything around them. And not comparing to others and having those conversations, I think, are great ways to help propel them forward. Um, and then make sure that also you're getting a little break once in a while to step back and take care of yourself so that mm -hmm. you're cognitively most able to deal with your young child. And let her struggle. Let her struggle. 
don't get anxious and upset about it. Let her struggle and label for her. Um, oh, it looks like you're trying hard at that. Or, oh, what do, what do you want to do next? As she gets more and more verbal, of course. Um, not getting upset when she doesn't get things or moves along. That, as a parent, be a bit more mindful and calm. As Sian's saying, she needs maybe a little more time uh, for this situation or what have you. Um, but not modeling for her that things have to be done a certain way, a certain time. You know, give her time to like deal with it, all right? And not to give the answers to the kids. Yeah, we know that letting kids struggle and try and figuring out the answers to a particular problem or situation can be really good, right? Mm -hmm. So not to jump in there right away. And I always think of the great example of the kid who falls down and doesn't know whether to cry or not, and it's totally dependent on what the parent does. Mm -hmm. And just remember that that takes cognitive resources in yourself, because you're going to have right. to suppress that oh shit reaction, right? Mm -hmm. It takes work, actually, to put on that brave face and say, oh, get up. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's, it's not just the falling down, it's in everything they do. So we'll go to the side. Uh, Stephanie Jasmine, I'm 2001 class for social work and public health, but among other things I'm a school board member and I'm particularly interested in hearing a little bit more about that transmission of anxiety from the teachers to the students and if you could speak a little bit more about ways that that can possibly be addressed, if it's professional development with the teachers and um, ways for new teachers coming up but also those that are in place right now. Yeah, so we did a study where we looked at teachers' math anxiety, first graders, and we looked at both at their kids' math um, ability and, and their anxiety at both the beginning and the end of the school year. And what we showed is that at the beginning of the year, there was no relationship between a teacher's math anxiety and her kids' math ability and their feelings about math, which is not surprising. They were randomly put in a classroom. But by the end of the school year, when kids were in classrooms, with first grade teachers who were really anxious about their own math ability, those children were learning less at math and the girls were more likely to endorse by the end of the school year that boys are better at math and girls are better at reading. So we've looked at what teachers are doing in the classroom. Um, one goes along with the response um, that was just given is that oftentimes when teachers are anxious about their own math ability, they don't want to be in situations where the kids are struggling. So they just give them the answer um, or they, um, are even negative about math, you know, if you, you get this either right or wrong, or, and they do less math throughout the day, right? Math is not just in those 20 or 30 minutes of math lesson. It can be in everything from how many minutes you're taking a nap to how many cookies you're getting. Um, so what do you do about it? One thing that we've shown that's really important is professional development, whether it's having math specialists or having teacher work circles or support for the teachers, not just about what they're feeling, but how to actually teach the math in multiple ways, in different ways, and deal with wrong answers that might be some hint that a kid is getting to a, the end of a concept but just doesn't have it right. Actually giving teachers those specific tools can be really helpful for reducing their own anxiety. Thank you. Sir? My name is Dr. Herbert Partis. I'm a professor of psychiatry at Columbia and Cornell. Uh, I want to address this to Dr. Alana. I just want to tell you guys are terrific. Um, two, two related questions. Um, we've also seen an increasing suicide rate mm -hmm. among adolescents around the country. Uh, number one, how much of that can be related back to uh, untreated anxiety disorders? And I know, Amber, you've discussed this. What do you forecast as some of the possibilities for people who have such anxiety disorders and go untreated? untreated? Yeah, well, this is a sobering and sad um, real statistic. Depression and suicide have been increasing in our youth, and especially for girls in this country. And one, there are many multiple pathways to um, both situations, but for the most part, we're looking at possibly low ability to sit problem solve, deal with situations in the moment. Much of what happens with suicide is an impulsive act after an interpersonal crisis, rejection or humiliation, um, cyberbullying and such like that, things like that that go on. And also when coupled with alcohol or substance use, 
it re, you know, the resources that the youth might have cognitively then are really getting uh, hampered. So they turn to suicide or in parasuicidal behaviors like cutting. What we really need to do is get a better handle on, again, educating while kids are home, while kids are in school, in high school, educating in some way about emotional health and wellness strategies and ways to outreach to others who can actually give you help in a moment. Dealing with shame is huge because a lot of suicide um, can be attributed when you look at the psychological autopsies of these kids or things that happened before, something where they felt intense shame. So helping kids to deal with that. Um, and not that we make youth the uh, overseers or, you know, of each other, but increasing awareness about relational aggression most specifically, which is big in girls, and that is where girls do really intense cyberbullying or other kinds of bullying to ostracize and exclude others. We have to start dealing with that and, and develop better ways of getting kids to problem solve and manage without doing such harm to one another. Do you want to add anything? Well, I would just say that at Barnard, we really use peers as um, an important form of support. So we have um, a whole center called Well Woman dedicated to helping peers support each other. So we have, and I think that's really important, especially when you go off to college, you're interacting with your roommate, you're interacting with people in your class. And one for us, it's getting students through the door if they need extra help. And so we think some of the best advocates for getting through the door to our psychologists, mm -hmm. to our psychiatrists, are peers, uh, sophomores, juniors, fourth years who've mm -hmm. um, had some of the experiences before. And so we mm -hmm. try and cast as wide a net as possible through different types of mm -hmm. proactive and preventative activities. Yeah. We should say there's a very, there's a fantastic website, the Jed Foundation, um, as it's called Set to Go. And it is a wonderful website for helping parents and also high school students who are getting ready to go off to college um, know what it takes to be successful in making that transition to emerging adulthood and managing what comes on in college. It also, it's great for suicide prevention, destigmatizing issues about mental health, how to talk about it and seek resources on campuses. So I direct you to the Jed Foundation for their, um, all the resources that they have. And it's not just for uh, families, but also for schools, for universities and such um, to get involved in different ways. How do you spell that? G-E-D, the Jed, Jed Foundation. G -E -D. G -E -D. J, sorry, oh, J-E-D, okay. good one. G-E-D. G-E-D. Sorry to break on the <laughs> yeah. I, I choked. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> but you survived. <laughs> I did. <laughs> Whitney Burkholtz, College 96. Um, I wanted to know, I have a six-year-old and a nine-year-old, so I want to know how you distinguish between healthy fears and anxiety at that age, and what are the red flags? Yeah. So we expect kids, as I said, to have fears at each age. But what you expect, these fears are because something cognitively and such they're developing. And in the environment, they're getting more responsibility, less oversight, and things like that, right, as they're making their way through the switch from preschool to school or baby, a babysitter nanny to school and so forth. So what's happening is, and you want them to sleep in their own bed and so on. So what's happening is, is that fears are coming on that are normal. You want to teach them in the moment how to comfort themselves in that situation. So have a routine around bedtime. Um, have a, a, a way of saying goodbye in the morning that's quick, you know, when you go off to work so that you don't have to stay there and so on. Um, when and so anxiety should tie, you know, tamp down over the course of a couple of weeks, really a couple of weeks. But if it doesn't, what you're looking at is the anxiety reaction continues and in fact, the child gets more and more distressed. You might see that they act up and they start talking about that situation more and more even before it's about to happen. It starts to interfere with their functioning. They come running into your room or you have to stay in bed with them, let's say, or you are delaying getting to work because you can't get out the door. So interference in functioning. So distress, the duration, interference in functioning. And, and then the other thing is that no matter what you do, you can't reassure your child. You're not able to, the re to reassure them and comfort them. 
So that's where, you know, we might be a little bit more on the border of an anxiety issue. The sooner you get some coaching and, and help, the better, because quite frankly, these are highly treatable conditions, especially when we get in there early. And this is again where we have to break down stigma, the idea of asking for help from parents. A lot of times it's the parent who's a little bit hesitant, or maybe they're getting the, the message from someone else, just write it out. You, sh you shouldn't be losing sleep. Your child should be sleeping. Your child should be playing with other kids and enjoying themselves. If that isn't happening, let's get somebody on board to help you out for a little bit. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Janice Horowitz, and I'm a Barnard graduate and a journalism school graduate. And actually, I ended up writing about health at Time Magazine. But um, So I have two questions. One is fairly, I think, easy and kind of a clinical quick thing, and that is, um, whether the research, or, is, or if in fact there is credible research on how the phone use for teenagers might interplay with their lacking or diminished coping skills. So that I think is easy. And the other um, is, uh, and by the way I was late, which makes me very anxious, because for all I know you spoke about that, but the other is more subtle, and that is, um, in seeking treatment, I know you talk about stigmatizing. Um, in a way, how does a parent and you as professionals diminish the pathologizing for the child? If a kid is going into a big machine and having their brain scanned, already that's kind of suggesting that that child's brain has something wrong or odd or worth viewing. Are there more benign ways of measuring anxiety which are less patho pathologically, I don't know what the word is, suggesting a pathology? Mm -hmm. And um, just as a little uh, addendum to that, um, you know, the practicing and practicing in a clinical setting, how again does that in fact diminish self-consciousness in the real world oh, or does I'll that, that increase? We'll first so those talk are, about self -thought. I guess sort of Okay, <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. So the phone one I think is easy. Um, let me say this that first of all the MRIs are usually used for research yeah. and so the families are consenting. Re MRIs are not diagnosing anxiety and they're not a part of a diagnostic test for anxiety or any disorder really that's a mental health condition at this point. Um, so what we do actually is we sit and we meet. Um, and m my colleague Wendy Silverman and I years ago developed the anxiety disorders interview schedule. We don't tell them I'm giving you the anxiety disorders interview <laughs> schedule, but we sit and meet and we have a conversation. And actually what happens in the course of our interview with the child, separately from the parents, is they actually feel relief. There are so many families, so many kids who were like, you get me because of the questions we're asking to help them un you know, uncover the different anxieties and such. So it's really about the conversation, the therapeutic relationship, and, and that where we, we get started with and we can diagnose what the different anxiety disorders or other kinds of psychiatric conditions are that are present. And then when you talk about uh, coming in and doing these rehearsals, well, one of the other things that we have been doing, and I started doing this many years ago, but it's a real critical component of our Youth Anxiety Center, is we might be doing exposures in our clinic, and we may be doing exposures in the virtual reality, but we're also going out into the streets. So I'm sorry if you're a restaurant owner around Columbus Circle and every once in a while five people come, sit at a table, you, then you, and they send the waitress or waiter away five times before they say we've changed our mind and leave, that's my kids. Um, we do all kinds of stuff. I'm sorry if you get somebody in front of you, a teenager or a, high, or a college student who's using a Metro card that is blank, 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 and it's holding up the line. That's our kids. We go into the real world with them and we do as much as possible in the environment um, and then ask them to do these things on their own. And the issue with breaking down stigma, quite frankly, it's not in the youngsters. It is in us. Those of us born before 19, no, maybe 2000. Those of <laughs> us born a while ago and are us as parents and such, we have to be more open. Kids will talk about and share with one another I have ADHD, I have anxiety, I am not ADHD, I am not anxiety, they get it that these are their Achilles heels and that they can master these things and work with these things and know how to plan for themselves when there's things coming up. But it's the parents, unfortunately, or the older generations where we're still stuck 
on, oh my gosh, it's a mental health problem. Yeah. Before we go to the cell phones, <laughs> again, I'm sorry everyone. <laughs> I think part of the question is, if you're in an MRI, isn't that automatically going to put on some of your, yeah. like, you're saying, I'm in this machine, so then how do you establish the baseline for when you determine that their reaction is actually to the math problem and not to the machine yeah. itself? Yeah, so being an MRI raises your anxiety. It's It can be, you know, it's it's this big magnet, right? Although I like it because you, you can go in there and you it's like you're really tight in. You can go to sleep. Sometimes I fall asleep when we're testing things because I'm, I'm the guinea pig. Um, but first of all, we have people who have, we have non-math anxious people, we have people who are anxious about math in, in the scanner, and you, get, you can get used to it, and even for kids, they have mock scanners, so you get to practice being mm -hmm. in this. Um, but we're always comparing to something else. So when we have people who are anxious about math, we're comparing what's happening in their brain when math is about to come up compared to when they're doing reading. So it's always that relationship. Um, or we compare a situation where they're just taking, doing some test problems um, or some practice problems to when we say, okay, this is the test. So we always have a comparison. But people get used to it. There's, lot, there's research those, showing. There are bands that measure brain waves. Yeah. There's the obvious palm or yeah. sweating pulse. Mm -hmm. those, you don't feel those are credible? No, right? we use those as well, but um, the, and we're not diagnosing with the MRI. Mm -hmm. Again, yeah, we're yeah. doing, it's a research tool, but yeah. what it allows us to do is ask questions about which areas of the brain are differentially activated when people are anxious versus not, or anxious about a particular subject. And what that helps us do mm -hmm. then is, as, is be very specific about the kind of psychological tool we would have them use to quiet down those areas. Mm -hmm. So we are actually getting to the, the end cell phone. of our time oh, yeah. yeah, but we do, so we do, so uh, I'm very, I'm sorry to the people whose questions that we weren't able to get to, and we thank you very much for coming. Um, and we thank both Dr. Albano and President Bilak. Uh, <laughs> but I should not have said thank you because we do want to get, this was on our list that we didn't get to and it's the role of technology and yeah. what you're finding and yeah. what it's doing. So if we could just address that. I'll say a little bit and then maybe you can add to this. One thing where we really are interested in what's going on is just the fact that it's a constant distraction, right? So when you focus on something and you have to then take your focus away to focus on something else, it's a cognitive load and a constant distraction. And oftentimes students, for example, have their phone next to them when they're doing homework. The switching, and we there are psychological studies done showing that we are not good multitaskers. We might think we're good multitaskers, but every time we have to take our attention off, it takes away from what we're doing. And if a child is working so hard in school and their attention's being dragged away, they're sort of working against themselves. So keeping... Well, I don't know about that. Well, yeah, we don't know about that, but it's a cognitive load, right? Yeah. And if you're always there and you're always in the moment, it can be a cognitive load that oftentimes you don't need. So strategies like keeping the phone out of the room while you do homework. Um, you know, there's, there's, psych, there's a research study showing that just there's only 1% of us who are actually can multitask. The rest, we lose on both tasks. And my older stepdaughter had her phone in when she was doing her homework in high school once, and I walked in and I said, you know, you're taking away from your own ability to focus. And of course, I told her about this study. She said, but I'm a, a, the one percenter. I'm a multitasker. <laughs> and I said, that's statistically very unlikely. <laughs> And so we worked on a plan, actually, to leave the phone out of the room when she was in. She could take a break after an hour and go check her phone, but she wanted to do well, and it was taking away. And the research right. shows that you cannot multitask. Well, good behavioral work in parenting. <laughs> the, the other thing is that what's been demonstrated in, in studies is that cell phone use by teenagers and being on the screen is increasing loneliness and, and decreasing happiness. Ki and here's the other thing, that kids are on screens and having friendships in the virtual world as opposed to actually making human contact with others. Those kids who do use screens a lot but also still go to club meetings, engage in sporting events with others, go out for pizza with friends, their happiness is up, they're less lonely. But you've got to watch that because it's, t it's substituting and there's this idea that they're connected, but there's somewhere in there they know they're not because they're reporting greater loneliness and depression. So we'll. So we'll just have some final. Thank you both Thank very you. much.